Hello everyone. I hope you were excited to take a journey through time as we investigate the validity of scripture and test the incredible story of Noah using history, linguistics, modern science, genealogical records, geographical locations, genetics, and much more. All to determine if the prophet and patriarch Noah mentioned in scripture was a real person or nothing but a mythological figure. And this is where our journey begins. We are going to be asking the questions. Is there archaeological evidence for this person? Is there genealogical evidence for this person? Is there historical evidence for this person? Is there linguistics evidence for this person? Is there genetic evidence for this person? And is there physical evidence for this person? So buckle up and stay tuned as we open the door of history to the most profound story in human existence. Join us on the quest for Noah. First, let's begin with the story itself for anyone who might not fully grasp what's mentioned in scripture. The word tells us that Noah was a righteous man and God found favor in him at a time when the world was full of evil. So God communicated directly to Noah that he was going to bring a global judgment against humanity for its evil ways. He told Noah to build an ark and that in 120 years, a flood is going to envelop the whole world. He was instructed to warn the people and have them repent and choose to get on this ark before it was too late. As years went by and the ark was being constructed, the people just ignored Noah, as the idea of a global flood was crazy. But then, as promised, the windows of heaven were opened, and it began to rain upon the face of the earth, and the fountains of the great deep broke forth. three months, there was no more land for humans to flee. Noah's pleas had fallen on deaf ears, and the people chose to let their own children die rather than turn from their evil ways and heed the dire warnings of Noah by getting on the ark. Noah and his sons and their wives were now inside the ark as the rain fell for forty days and nights. Then, after 150 days, the flood waters began to recede, and Noah began to see the tops of mountains. He let birds go, testing to see whether or not there was nearby land. One day, a bird finally returned with an olive branch, and he knew the time was at hand. The ark eventually came to rest somewhere on the mountains of Ararat and the animals and Noah and his family got off the ark and life started over. Noah was said to have planted grapes near the mountain where the ark landed and cities were also built by his sons. Not many generations later, however, 
mankind was back to their old ways. But this time, building a tower to reach into the heavens so that they could survive another flood if God sent one to judge them. You see, God, just like in early Genesis, instructed man to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. But man was not doing this. They were not interested in God's rules. And they were united in their power-hungry struggle to make a name for themselves. So God sent the Spirit upon them that they might forget their own native tongue and acquired an entirely new one. Because of this, the people eventually scattered and migrated to their allotted lands that each of Noah's sons had inherited. It is from this story that we can put together a list of criteria to test and determine if this is just a myth or is it a true story. And this is where our story begins. Let's begin our journey looking at the most incredible aspect of the story, and that is the ages of the patriarchs. Noah was said to have been around 500 years old when he had kids and then went on and got a vision from God that a global judgment was coming and to build an ark. If this was true, what evidence do we have for such an extreme long lifespan in the past? So we have to ask ourselves the logical question. If you were writing a book about the history of the world and were trying to get people to believe your creation story, would you really just start off with people living to almost a thousand years old and a 500 year old man having kids, then building a ship to survive a global flood? No, come on, that makes no sense. You would write a story similar to how the Greeks did and match people alive at the same time as much as possible. A lot of people say, well, these ages can't be true. They must be just lunar months. Well, that fails as well because we find that they were having kids around 65 years of age. If those turned into lunar months, that would turn them into just five years old when they had children, which is ludicrous. Now remember, before we get into this, the biblical model says that Neanderthal, Denisovan, Erectus, all of these are just regular humans. Evolution theory has named them and assigned them different names to these fossils, but we know from their bone structure, their superior constitution, and the fact that we bred with them, it shows that they are the same species as us, and they are just earlier humans right off the ark. So when you hear those names, erase the evolutionary concepts from your mind, that these are nothing but subhuman species. They are not. They are us. We are them. All that happened is that over time we lost these robust features since we no longer live these long lives nor have the same lifestyle. I mean, just look at the diversity of skulls all found in this single region. That's right, all of these people lived at exactly the same time at the same place. But yet the skulls look entirely different from one another and they have been categorized as different subspecies. This makes no sense because it's not true. We have over 15 reasons to conclude that man lived longer in the past and that our genetic potential is somewhere near a thousand. So then, what is the evidence that mankind could have lived a long time in the past? It's not like we can just go to some ancient human and find an ID in their grave and say, oh look, Noah was 900 years old. So we have to look at the genome of both modern and ancient man to resolve this question. Let's begin with what is aging? Why do we inevitably die from old age? Well, there's two major factors that contribute to this. Genetics and overall DNA damage and loss. We used to think that genetics only played a very small role, if any factor at all, in determining how long we lived. The numbers changed all the time. We know better now. And the more we learn, the more we see that number grow. Another contributing factor is that of DNA loss. You see, every cellular replication that happens, we lose bits of DNA. Picture this happening like opening a zipper. The metal or plastic teeth along the edges of the zipper represent DNA. As we age, the zipper opens more and more. Thus, the more DNA is lost till eventually too much has occurred and the damage is done and we die. This is called the Hayflick limit. When cells divide, that genetic material needs to be copied. This is called DNA replication. Unfortunately, every replication doesn't bring the full DNA sequence with it. And after 40 to 60 cellular replications today, people die because just too much DNA loss has occurred. So, if we're losing bits of DNA every replication, 
and then we die when we lose too much, then logic tells us that if we had more DNA in the past, then we could live longer, since more DNA could be lost before too much damage has occurred killing us. Think of your genome like glass. Now think of DNA damage like a crack in that glass. A crack in a small window is catastrophic, but that same size crack on a larger window doesn't cause nearly as much damage and is not as bad overall. So, if our ancient patriarchal ancestors had more DNA than us today, then it would validate that they would have the biological potential to live much longer. What do we see? Exactly that. They had not just a little more, they had a lot more. Nearly an entire chromosome worth more. That's right, they had so much more DNA that it amounts to nearly the size of the entire Y chromosome. Imagine how much more damage the genome could handle with so much more DNA. That's a lot of buffer. Now we know that a lot of animals, aquatic life, and reptiles never stop growing until they die. So therefore, the larger the shark or reptile, the longer it lived. So if they lived longer in the past, and we know ancient man ate these things, then why is it impossible for us to think that man also did not live longer in the past since they lived at the same time? We know that man lived alongside of these creatures because we found evidence of tool markings on the very bones that came from them scraping meat from these creatures, and then they made jewelry out of them. We have evidence that they ate giant cave bears and sea tortoise and the now extinct auroch. They ate giant deer, giant sloth, and even giant cows, including sharks and dolphins. And we have evidence a giant bird ate a Neanderthal child. Clearly, they all lived together. So, we have humans living at the same time when all of these other long-living creatures were. Yet, for some reason, we're told to believe that man alone was immune to these biological effects of a longer life that all of these other life forms seem to take advantage of. That makes no sense. Geneticists who work exclusively on aging all agree that we can live much longer in the future through genetic manipulation. One of the leading aging researchers, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, has said that humans, with the aid of gene editing via the removal of mutations, should be able to live for a thousand years. He Doctor, can you talk about the impact of regenerative medicine and, and what would that have on longevity? What are we talking about in the big picture, not only on length of years, but on quality of life as well? Sure. We do not know at this point how long people will live when they receive the therapies that we're working on at the moment and that mm -hmm. I think we have a good chance of developing within the next couple of decades. What we do know, however, is that any longevity benefits that might accrue from these therapies will be a side effect of health. You've said that you think there's a good chance there's a person alive today that might live to be a thousand. I think it's possible that we could see really extraordinary lifespans. We could even see people living as long as a thousand years. It's people, that's hard for people to grasp, I think, when, when you talk about their life expectancy now. It is hard for people to grasp, and that's why I say, listen, just don't be distracted by it. It is just a distraction. <laughs> what matters is staying healthy now, staying healthy in 20 or 30 or 40 years. Forget about how long you're going to live. It's not, it's not relevant. So, if genetically we can get there by using technology to essentially revert our genome back to a mutation-free state, then why is it impossible to think that our ancestors who were more mutation-free didn't live as long as modern-day geneticists are saying that we should live to be? I mean, isn't it a pretty big coincidence that secular science just so happens to throw out the biblical patriarch ages of longevity as our genetic potential? The patriarchal drive study shows that after 10 generations from the flood, Abraham was already dead from old age at 175. That's down from 950 years old in just 10 generations. Jacob, four generations later, died at 145. And by the time of Moses, seven generations after him, we have a 120-year maximum lifespan plateau. So the drop from maximum lifespan to a plateau of 120 was rapid, about 20 generations in all. Not only does the 2012 study show that the father's age contributes the most mutational load to the offspring, which Noah would have passed on the most in history, affecting all of humanity alive today, but we also see the same results in experiments today, 
and they are identical to what patriarchal drive discovered. We see this in inbreeding experiments. The same biological decay curve happens in birds, rodents, dogs, and fish. So if we see these same results in animal experiments and simulations that essentially are the same as the theme in the Bible and the story of Noah, then why is it impossible to think that this could not be the case? Of course it would be. And the predictive power of the biological decay curve in patriarchal drive is spot on. They even admit that something happened around 5,000 years ago that caused harmful mutations to arise out of nowhere and then explode in the human population. Our world in the past was very different going back in time. There was more magnetism, double atmospheric pressure and oxygen. All of these things are conducive to a longer lifespan. But it is obvious that man lived longer in the past and his true potential was somewhere nearing 1,000. Let's go over them. One, genetics is the major cause for aging and we inherited a genetic burden through Noah and his extreme age topped with inbreeding. Animal Studies and Patriarchal Jive by John Sanford and Dr. Robert Carter validate this correlation and show an identical biological decay curve that we would expect to see if the biblical story of Noah was true and the ages in scripture were a fact. So if the evidence corresponds to what scripture says, why not believe that it was true? The predictive power of patriarchal drive shows us what happens when extremely aged fathers do have offsprings, what the results would be. They line up perfectly with what we would expect to see if a human who was 500 years old had children. And the statistical probability of this lining up with the biological decay curve is beyond coincidence. We now have learned that mutations are passed on based on the father's age. And the older they are, the more mutations are passed down, on and on. And it just so happens to line up perfectly with what scripture tells us about Noah and his age when he had his children and the genetic mutational load he placed on them, which would have reduced not only their lifespan, but all future generations if Noah was truly that old when he was a father. If all of these are not true, then why? Number two, a larger genome in humans allows for more damage to occur. And we now have evidence that we had much larger genomes in the past, which logically concludes that we could have lived much longer from this alone. If not, why not? Three, other cultures mention a time called the Golden Age. It's quite peculiar that civilizations that supposedly never met all decided to come up with this idea that humanity lived to extreme ages in the past. Why would they all invent the exact same ridiculous idea? Four, we have clear evidence that telomeres get shorter every generation, yet the decay rate stays the same, which validates that people had the potential to live much longer in the past just from having more padding protecting the ends of the chromosomes. The logical conclusion with this evidence would be that this allowed people to live longer. If not, why? Five, we literally have genealogies that go back to Noah from different places in the world. These are not biblical genealogies. These are outside lineages of unbroken chains of royalty going all the way back to Noah from different places in the world. Clearly, these were real people. If they were not, when did they stop being real people and turn into myth? Number six, in the past we find more oxygen, more pressure, more magnetism. All have been documented and shown to extend lifespan. So if all of these conditions were met in the past, why could man not have lived longer just from these aspects alone? Seven, aging is related to genetics. There is no doubt about this. Since it is genetic, then genetics gives us an answer to the riddle of human lifespan. If aging is related to mutations, then we can predict that removing mutations is better for us and we would live longer. We see this is true in multiple studies. And now we have entire laboratories dedicated to human longevity, like the Sense Foundation, Unity, i the Methuselah Foundation, and the Longevity Science Foundation, and many more. Our model answers this paradox of human aging, but evolution has many theories trying to solve this riddle and explain the discrepancy. That is why it is a paradox for them, because it makes no sense evolutionarily. Number 12. Mutation rates are too fast for humanity to be very old. In our model, this is easily explained from NOAA, and we can see that these mutation rates and both SNVs 
and harmful mutations arising at this time. Number eight. We know mutations are building up and up and up, compiling with no way for the body to get rid of them. There are many names in biology for this, but this mutation accumulation problem has led geneticists to question how humanity could have ever lived as long as it has. How could these mutations, which are lowering fitness, adding disease to the population, and overall harming the system, not be evidence of a longer lifespan going backwards in time? We know mutation accumulation is a real problem, but here's the dead giveaway that it is true. The human genetic mutation database alone tells us this. Selection is not stopping nor having any effect on this, and beneficial mutations are nowhere to be found to help. What do we see? Genetic degradation and mutation accumulation. And top that with the fact that the average person is missing over 100 genes. How can evolution try to tell us one thing when we're seeing the exact opposite? And if this is what we see, why wouldn't ancient man with less mutation saturation overall not live as long? 9. Removing mutations from just a single gene in mice allowed them to live 23% longer. And they admit that the same should roll over into humans. Now think about this. If they removed mutations from just those 20 longevity genes, that's an increase of lifespan over 460% or 672 years of age. All we actually need to do is remove them from 25 genes, and we now have the potential to live for 1,000 years. This is a 787% increase in lifespan. And this evidence is more proof that an ancestral genome with less mutations was far superior than ours today. If not, why is this evidence wrong? Why are the geneticists wrong? Number 10. Fitness is going down over time. This means logically that going back in time, fitness was greater. The more fitness, we know the more likely an individual is able to survive and live longer to reproduce. So I believe people saying that, oh, we don't live long today, so we couldn't in the past, is just like saying, well, creatures today don't live long, so there's no way they were living longer in the past either. Well, of course they were, and we know they were. So the same conclusions we can deduce with humans. Number 11, inbreeding reduces lifespan, and inbreeding studies follow the same biological decay curve as to what we see when we look at Noah's offspring. Number 12, Humans do not speciate, so we have no way of helping buffer additional mutations added to our genome. There is no way natural selection can save us. Only gene editing can resolve our future extinction. What gene editing does is erase mutations. Since mutations are leading to shorter lifespan, less fitness, and more disease, then we know that removing them is imperative to overall better health and lifespan. If mutations were not a problem for aging and disease, then geneticists would not be trying so hard to figure out how to remove them to extend human life and rid disease. Yet, they are. Why is that? Number 13. Another line of evidence that people could have lived longer is that scripture tells us that the pre-flood people ate a plant-based diet. Meat was condoned only after the flood, and we know today that cooking meat ages the body greatly. It adds carcinogens and what's known as advanced glycotic end products, and the acronym for it is AGE, because it ages us rapidly. So again, logically we can conclude that if people today are eating things that are aging them more rapidly, but our ancient ancestors didn't eat those things, they probably lived longer. If not, why? Number 14. We have discovered that the younger somebody is when they reach puberty, the faster they will age. Since puberty determines how long we will live, and then we find that early man aged extremely slow as children in comparison to today, then that means their upper age limit is also increased. Logic tells us then that if early man was not reaching puberty till late in life, it means they biologically age slower as adults, looking at the fossils themselves. 15. Our leading geneticists on biological aging all agree that man could live to a thousand if we remove mutations through gene editing software. Why are they wrong when all of the evidence and actual repeated studies have shown us that we are headed in that direction and that they are correct in this prediction? And why does it happen to just line up so coincidentally with the Bible?
Ken, the question would be then, the patriarchs, as you mentioned, lived a very long time in scripture. And as you know, we only have some fossils and some genetics, but what would be the best forms of examples that you would like to give to people to say that Noah and the patriarchs lived for extended periods of time? All right, if you go to uh, just Google the word uh, golden age or two words, golden age, I think there's a lot of cultures around the world that teach man used to live to be a thousand. That's called the golden age. Well, this is my chart here. The Bible says before the flood came, the people lived to be 900. Adam was 930. After the flood, it dropped off right away to 400 and then 200 and then 100. And today, hardly anybody makes it to 100. Okay, I'm gonna make it to 100 or die trying. But things were different back before the flood came. Why did they live so long? Average age before the flood is 912, according to the Bible. So the short answer, why did they live so long? <clears throat> they had a perfect genetic code. You and I are copies of the code that our parents had. Well, when you copy a complex code, you're likely to have some mistakes made. When you copy a program like Microsoft Word onto a flash drive, is there a chance some mistakes will be made? Sure. Is there a chance some improvements will be made? No chance. When you copy that code, there's a chance of losing some things, but no chance of gaining anything useful. And you're actually, you're a copy off of a copy of your grandparents. And a copy off 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 a copy of, of Adam. So the fact that we can still talk at all and sit here and think about it is pretty amazing. So they had the perfect gene code. They was actually designed to live forever. They had a perfect diet. God told them what to eat, fruit, vegetables, and seeds. After the flood, God said, Noah, now you can eat meat. But before the flood, they were all vegetarian, for the Bible teaches. They had perfect soil and probably covering 90% of the earth. Today, the earth is 70% underwater. They had perfect soil everywhere, I think. They had increased air pressure. I'm a firm believer in what's called the canopy theory, that there used to be a layer of ice above the atmosphere, squeezing the air down into maybe 10 miles, increasing air pressure making it easier to breathe. Now, when I climb Mount Rainier, 14,000 feet, you can hardly breathe up there. And that's only a little over two miles. You go up five miles, Mount Everest, and you, you, you couldn't stay there long without dying, for, well, for being cold for one thing, but also no food. But eh, if you go up 10 miles, like uh, some of the uh, astronauts go around, man, then the air's almost non-existent, real thin. So increasing air pressure would allow them to get, every time you take a breath of air, you get double or triple the oxygen in your lungs. You could run for hundreds of miles without getting tired. They also had filtered sunlight. I think a canopy of ice overhead would block out some of the bad ray boys, you know, beta rays, gamma rays, x-rays, and they would help them to live longer. The less UV light, less x-rays. It's not just the Bible that teaches that they lived a long time. Many cultures have legends of a golden age. They say man used to live to be a thousand, did not have to work to grow food, and died peacefully in his sleep. The term golden age comes from Greek mythology, it works in days of Hesiod, and is part of the description of the temporal decline of the state of people through five ages. The golden age, golden race of humanity. Those in the first age were ruled by Kronos, where we get the word sun, okay? After the finish of the first age was the silver, then the bronze, etc. Just Google golden age, there's plenty about it in the, on, on the internet. <clears throat> denotes a period of primordial peace, harmony, stability, and prosperity. People did not have to work to feed themselves. For the earth provided food in abundance. They lived to a very old age with a youthful appearance, eventually dying peacefully with spirits living on as guardians. Back in uh, 397, Plato talked about the golden race of humans that came first. Let's see, Hesiod maintains that during the golden age, before the invention of the arts, the earth produced food in such abundance there was no need for agriculture. Oh. That's the arms and legs never failing. They made merry with feasting beyond the reach of all the devils. When they died, it was as though they had overcome with sleep and they had all good things. Golden age. So there's this historical evidence and there's biblical evidence that men used to live a lot longer. Plus, I think when God created them, Adam and Eve came fully loaded computer. They were created first day. They could talk, walk, name the animals and get married first day. 
They already had a head full of knowledge put planted there by the, I mean, when I buy a computer, it's already got programs on there. Yeah, okay, they're preloaded. Adam and Eve were preloaded and they could have lived forever had they not sinned. So then the, God probably gave them all kinds of information like how to talk. Language itself is pretty complicated. They already had that. So then they could pass that on to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Adam lived long enough, you can see right there, to almost meet Noah. Noah's daddy, Lamech, probably knew Adam. I mean, I think it'd kind of be a, everybody in the world would want to go back and meet Adam if you're alive. It's, oh, Adam just lives, you know, 4,000 miles away, let's go. And if you're 15 feet tall and have extra oxygen, you can run probably as fast as your car could go. So just run over and see Adam, I don't know, just guessing. The question I have for you, and you've done just such a fantastic job answering this question in the past. You put out videos on it. It's a common question though. And so I wanted to ask you, how do the declining lifespans that are described in Genesis genealogies, how do those convince you about the flood or even just the Bible as a whole? So, so I worked in the field of data sciences as a te testifying expert for over 20 years in state and federal court cases. <clears throat> I worked as an expert in over 100 state and federal court cases dealing with statistics and regression and data and analysis and research methods and everything. And you just come to the point after doing this for a while where you have like a meta level understanding of data and probability. And whoever was recording those lifespans in Genesis, Genesis chapter five, and how many years they were recorded and re-recorded and transcribed over and over and again, you can realize that it's not a random phenomenon. And, and I realized that from the pattern just by eyeballing it, but my gosh, when you take those lifespans and you plot them out, 30 or 40 of them of the pre-flood patriarchs that lived an average of 912 years, then they start declining in their lifespans. Like Noah was 600 years when the flood hit. He lived 350 years afterwards. So he, he lived to be 950. His grandfather, Methuselah, lived to be 969. And then afterwards, after the flood, Shem, his son, lived to be 600. Several generations later, you have Peleg, lived 239 years old. We don't have anybody living that long. And then we've got Abraham living to be 175 and Moses living to be, what, 120. So you have what's called a curvilinear decline shape that's going on in these years. So without even getting into the data sciences part of it, which is profound in and of itself. You just have to look at the state and think, my gosh, we have dozens of years of the lifespans of these guys and they don't fall off a cliff. They don't go from 912 years, all of a sudden 70 years, like we see now or hundred years or whatever. They, they don't fall off a cliff. They stay, they slope down over dozens and dozens of recorded lifespans. They go down from 600s to 500s to 400s, 300s, 200s, to, down into the 100s. You think, well, why on earth would these ancient Bible authors writing with with quell pens, with 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 hoodies on and, and, and firelight, you know, with little candles and everything, writing on animal parchment, why would they write these declining lifespans? It wouldn't make any sense. No one would buy it. Everyone knows that people only live to be a hundred years old or ninety years old. Why would they even write these mythal I can imagine being a monk back in the day, getting the scroll I'm supposed to copy, going, What? 969 years, I'm not gonna copy this. This is crazy myth, fairy tale stuff, but that's not the case. So they faithfully recorded it over a 2,900 year time span of when those, Bi the, those Bible passages were recorded over multiple generations and no one changed the years. So that must mean <clears throat> that these guys believed that these years were real. So that that's one. So either they believed that these years were real or they were all involved in a multi-generational lie to extend the lifespans 10 times more than those people groups were watching people live. That's not a good choice for me. So let's throw the data up on a probability standpoint and look to see if it fits anything that we know from science. Well, it does. It fits what's called a power law curve with an R square of 0.95, which means 95% of the data points fall along a scientifically predictable slope. And it's not by chance. And when then you join that 
probability that observation, and by the way, it's the probability that line and the slope existing is like into the quadrillions. When I would testify an expert, all you need to is hit the 5% level of chance. Well, this thing's way beyond the 5% level, level of chance. It's in the point zero 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 zero. Something's going on with this power law curve, right? So, and then you you talk with an expert geneticist like Dr. John Sanford, you know, PhD from, from Cornell University. He's like, oh yeah, I'll tell you exactly what's going on. It's a biological decay curve. Anytime you take a population of millions of people and bottleneck them down like in the flood to just eight people and they start inbreeding, what happens? Mutations exponentially increase. They don't, they don't just 10X overnight per generation they exponentially increase. And while the mutations are exponentially increasing, what's happening to the lifespans? They're exponentially decreasing. Mm -hmm. You guys, it's a perfect fit. I mean, that thing alone as a statistician, I look at that, I'm like, case closed, game over. Something happened back in the past that caused the human lifespans to exponentially decline. And it's currently in our gene pool today. The footprint's still there. The fact that our, 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 our mutations are exponentially increasing. I mean, heck, just go try and experiment with golden retrievers, take a brother and a sister and breed them. See how long those puppies live, you know, or take a brother and sister today. There's a 25% chance of a, of a physical mutation occurring if a brother and sister have kids. So they're exponentially creating it for me. It perfectly proves the flood because you've only have two choices. Either those ancient Bible writers with their quill feather pins were carrying along a 2,900 year lie and they knew exponential math to fit a decay curve that is a parallel curve, making this stuff up or their real lives and something happened to our gene pool to exponentially increase mutations that would result in exponentially declining lifespans. So for me, I take the latter option. It fits the explanation better. Amen. That's the most parsimonious answer. I love the way you put it. We, we literally have the footprints of this in our genomes. The yeah. mutation rate is high. Deleterious mutations are accumulating. And so I, I love how this all lines up, as you've put it, Dan, with known biological, mathematical, and genetic related data. We're literally looking at a classic biological decay curve when, when compared to the genealogies. Yeah, it's, it's very true. Absolutely. Next, is there genealogical evidence for this person existing? If so, what is it? Well, there is. And the evidence exists all around the world. But one of my personal favorites is housed in the British Museum, where we find the King's List. This is an unbroken chain of royalty going back to Noah himself. This list goes through ancestors of Queen Elizabeth II of England and goes all the way back through the Kings of Wessex to a one named Skeef, marked as a son of Noah born on the Ark. The original text is on display in the British Museum of History and is dated as authentic. What is amazing is not only is the chain of direct descent unbroken, but it's also the exact number of generations we would expect to find if the biblical history was true and not evolution. What are the odds of this? The book I made to go along with this titled The Quest for Noah gives many more examples. But let's move on. Next, what historical evidence is there for this person? Well, we have flood legends from around the world. Some critics try to say, well, of course, because there's local floods that happen all over the world. However, we have to go again with statistical probability on this one because of all the different stories having similar themes, which makes their argument fall apart. We have stories talking about a favored family with a total of eight survivors, the main character was given a warning first by God. Animals were taken and saved. He released a bird to look for land. And a boat was coming to rest on a mountain with people getting off and starting over. This is beyond coincidence. But to top it off and to make their argument even more preposterous is that we find the same legend of the Tower of Babel also worldwide. So now the coincidence is even more in favor of scripture as the odds of both of these concepts existing worldwide in supposed people groups who have never met 
is just beyond improbable. Let me just read one story to you. It comes from Korea. This evidence goes all the way back to the Chaosan Dynasty between 1392 and 1910 AD. It was a Korean kingdom that was isolated from Europeans and therefore had no contact with Christianity or Judaism. In 1965, a group of sailors from the Netherlands were sailing to Japan when they were shipwrecked off Jeju Island, off the coast of South Korea. 36 Dutch sailors survived the sinking of their ship and were taken as prisoners from the island to the capital city of Seoul in South Korea. They spent 12 years in Korea, during which time they learned the Korean language. In 1666, eight of the surviving prisoners were able to escape to Japan. One of those survivors, named Hendrik Hamel, spent a year in Nagasaki, Japan, writing about his experience in Korea. In the book, later translated into English, titled Hamel's Journal, he wrote about the beliefs of the Confucian monks. He documented, The monks believed that long ago all people spoke the same language, but when people built a tower in order to climb into heaven, the whole world changed. The Korean monks held their belief about one language and the tower in 1660. This means that these accounts are separated by more than 3,100 years and 8,065 kilometers. Remember, according to the Korean monks, the entire world's population spoke one language, the people constructed a tower, their goal was to climb into heaven, and their efforts affected the entire world. Remember, they never encountered a Christian, a Jewish person, or the Bible at all. Yet they all have the same conclusions that we find in scripture and throughout the world. Yet again, what are the odds of this? This is all documented in Hamel's journal and a description of the kingdoms of Korea, 1653. The quest for Noah brings us to the world of genetics. It is in our genetics that we can best answer the question of ancestry. It is our genes, our traits that are inherited sperm and egg. Not a fossil, not geography, but again, genes and traits. We have discovered our last Y chromosomal ancestor, Noah, directly in the genomes of living human beings. The Y chromosome is uniparentally inherited DNA. This means that it is passed down on one side, and in this specific case, the father's line. This means the Y chromosome is paternally inherited. It turns out that we only find one male Y chromosome. Every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical and can be traced back to a single ancestor who is Y chromosome Noah. The rate as to which the Y chromosome changes or mutates is fast, a lot faster than the evolutionary community has ever predicted. Fathers pass on genetic mistakes or mutations to their children at the rate of one to three new mutations per generation. In light of the fact that male Y chromosomes worldwide have incredibly low genetic diversity. Again, every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical. And the mutation rate is fast in this Y chromosome. The Y chromosome must be young. There are simply not tens of thousands of years worth of DNA variation created through mutations in the Y chromosome. As a matter of fact, when we compare the Y chromosomes of humans and chimpanzee, our supposed closest cousin, the evolutionary community argues that we and chimpanzees share a recent common ancestor somewhere between six and 10 million years ago. And we supposedly split from that common ancestor. But when we compare Y chromosomes of humans and chimpanzees, we find that they are only about 35 to 40% the same. This is when we consider overall gene content, size differences, and architecture. They are nothing alike. They are highly divergent, which was a surprise to the evolutionary community, which if human evolution was true and we really do share a common ancestor with the chimpanzee, then the Y chromosome should have been a lot more similar.
The evolutionary community is faced with a challenge in light of this data that contradicts their uh, viewpoint of origins and ancestry. They're going to have to account for such massive differences in the Y chromosomes between humans and chimpanzees, since they want to claim humans and chimpanzees are related through common ancestry. All of this data pro provides us with compelling evidence for a Y chromosome that is young and also perfectly consistent with the biblical model of ancestry. Our actual common ancestor probably lived as early as 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. All this shows that we are so closely related, more so than we could ever imagine. Next, is there linguistic evidence for this person and the story we find in scripture? Well, what do we see when we look up the origins of written language worldwide? Do you notice something? It all appears at the same time. Now think about that for just one second. Let's compare that with what we were taught in school regarding evolution. We have people living in Africa for over 150,000 years before branching out and filling up the rest of the world. Then, just in the last 5,000 years, they all just managed to invent writing systems all at the same time. This is just another ridiculous notion to even consider, but this is what secular academia wants you to believe. Ignore the obvious, ignore Occam's razor, ignore scripture at all cost, and just believe the highly improbable story that they invented based on a lie anyway. This paradox in evolution theory is called the sapient paradox, and it goes like this. Why did man go through a bottleneck 200,000 years or more ago and then wait 195,000 years before simultaneously creating everything like farming, writing systems, mathematics, astrology, medicine, domestication, agriculture, and documenting all of human history? All while perfectly matching the oldest trees on earth that do not die from old age and population growth rates all in the recent past that match a recent global flood bottleneck. The reason they will never solve their paradox is because they cannot view history through the lens of scripture. They have taken a pagan idea of some history and placed it as the only theory allowed to be taught and it's protected by law. Evolution theory has doomed science because it is not allowed falsification and has no predictive power. But let's just take a quick look at some of the oldest writing systems on Earth. Take for example Chinese. It is one of the actual oldest that we have on Earth. And their entire writing system and alphabet revolves around scripture itself. Take English. It arose from Paleo-Hebrew, which built into it is the story of creation as well. Some people believe that the Indian writing system, the Dravidian language family, is the oldest on earth. But look at that. We found it's only 4,500 years old. Do you notice how everything just falls into place when you use scripture as the foundation? And when you try to force fit the data into the evolutionary worldview timeline, it all falls apart and nothing makes sense. And you end up with logical paradoxes that we find all over the place. Now, if you want more examples of these language writing systems, again, I have them through the book. But let's move on. What about phenotypic diversity? This just means physical appearance, by the way. Clearly, if all humans got off the ark at the same time and moved to different places on the earth, then diversity should be equal between everyone, right? This would not be the case if evolution was true, however, since evolution teaches that humans evolved in Africa and stayed on the continents over a hundred thousand years. So clearly Africans would have the most phenotypic diversity out of all humans, and Europeans would have the least amount. If this was true, then that would create what is known as a nested hierarchical pattern, with Africans being the most diverse, if evolution is true, right? Well, let's investigate that. Well, for one, we notice that all humans are equal in phenotypic diversity, with extremely high amounts of diversity compared to all primates, which have low phenotypic diversity between themselves. 
Africans, Europeans, and Asians all have equal amounts of diversity between them all, exactly what we would expect to find if the biblical story was true, but not what we would expect to find if evolutionary model was true. Why is that? It should be obvious. The evolutionary story is not true, and everything matches the history described in scripture. Another myth all of a sudden became a reality. So they start excavating in 1931. What they found that was bizarre to them is that originally they didn't really believe that there was an ancient city that had been destroyed from a flood. So they excavate down, they get 45 feet down, and they finally find the ruins of Shirupak. They then backtracked and they analyzed the 45 feet above it. They found no human remains and they found no human evidence at all. So they're like, wait, wait, wait. So this flood could have been real. And they expected to find other evidence of civil civilizations that had cohabited and, and lived there. They found none. It was buried under so much debris that the people that came later didn't even know it existed. In 2011, we rediscovered the Tower of Babel inscription. Originally excavated in 1917 by Robert Coldway, carved on a black stone, the inscription dates to 604 to 562 BC. The spectacular stone monument clearly shows the Tower of Babel and King Nebuchadnezzar II, who ruled Babylon. He rebuilt the tower and dedicated it to Murdoch Baghdad in the 6th century BC. The temple was called the Foundation of Heaven and Earth and existed in the south of Baghdad. The tower had eroded from time and was fully destroyed by Alexander the Great around 330 BC, who afterwards wanted to rebuild the temple new again. But on his death, the project was abandoned, and all we have today are the foundations where it once stood, discovered by world-renowned archaeologist Dr. Clifford Wilson in 1997. This tower was still visible during the 5th century and was documented by Herodotus. We read, The tower was still in existence in my time. It has a solid central tower, one stadium square, with a second erected on top of it and a third and so on up to eight. All eight towers can be climbed by a spiral way running around the outside, and about halfway up there are seats for those who make the ascent to rest on. Once declared as a symbol of oppression, it is now argued by many as simply being merely another symbolic myth, such as many other stories found within religious writings. However, there are numerous details which cannot escape the microscope of some investigators. And now that a brick has been found, legitimately dated to this time, and commissioned by the same claimed king, the argument for the actual past existence of this incredible structure has gained traction within even the most skeptical academic mind. A brick stamped with the seal of the ancient Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II, biblically stated as the man who commissioned the construction of the tower itself has been discovered. In the book of Genesis, what we have here is a brick which fits exactly into that specific context. There can be no doubt that the stimulus for the story and the narrative must have taken shape during the Babylonian exile. The evidence could help to prove the existence of the Tower of Babel. Yet, as always, regardless of the corroborating evidence, it will, like the many other details and aspects of the claimed tower, continue to encounter dismissal by many. Did you know there's approximately five or 6,000 years of recorded human history? Writing was invented around 3300 BC, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamia Valley. Today that's Iraq. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist, said it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, were invented around 3000 BC. Chinese pictogram characters around 2600 BC. Indus Valley civilizations, they invented a type of writing back then. Richard Overy wrote in The Times Complete History of the World, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5500 years ago and the beginning of a written or pictorial history. And uh, so let's round it out to 6000. 6000 years is not that long. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years? or maybe close to a grandmother. We're talking 60 grandmothers and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. What about archeological evidence? 
Well, the evidence for this is strong as well. Not only do we have evidence for all 16 cities named after Noah's grandchildren, but we also now have evidence for two of Noah's own children, Japheth and Shem, as we have located their tombs. That's right. PhD linguist and explorer William H. Shea was traveling north from Armenia's capital. He took photographs of Mount Aragats as he was traveling past the area. And when he got back home, he began to look over the photographs and he noticed something peculiar. He documented, From a study of these photographs, I was convinced that there was some rock-cut carvings on the southern slope of this mountain, just above Lake Kerry. I wanted to examine these carvings, so I went back to Armenia of June 2004, accompanied by a professional photographer friend of mine. On June 28th, they set out to Lake Kerry on Mount Aragast. Upon arriving at the parking lot at one end of the lake, the guide asked where they wanted to go. His friend pointed to the slopes of the mountain nearest the parking lot, where he said that they might find some carvings. Lo and behold, he was correct. We read, As we reached the far point, I saw a large rock, about four feet by six feet in size. Approaching it, I noticed the figure of a large snake cut into the upper edge. I knew, from this, I knew we had made a find because in the earliest alphabet, the snake stands for the letter N, which comes from the Semitic Nahash, which means snake. The rest of the relief and carved inscriptions can be deciphered as, the dove took wing from the ark here. So he states, it came as a complete surprise to find a couple of brief alphabetic inscriptions there since I had previously assumed that any writing found in the area near the landing of Noah's Ark would be in cuneiform. But here it was, in the alphabetical script related to proto synatic the earliest written alphabet of mankind, known originally from the turquoise mines, from the mid-2nd millennium BC, and more recently from the early 2nd millennium BC found in Egypt. Here was an earlier form of that Semitic alphabet first found in eastern Turkey and now in Armenia for the first time ever. After a couple of days of sightseeing in the area and taking the directions we observed in the stone, we left for the town of Sision, a three-hour drive south. On a Friday morning, we drove just three kilometers south to Karahunj, which is a large field of megaliths that some call the Armenian Stonehenge. While the standing stones of Karahun are not as tall as those in Stonehenge in England, there are many more of them, and they are spread out over a much larger area. The highest number that I saw was 180, and there may have been more than that, as they are spread out close to over a quarter of a mile in distinct rows. We had spent more than two hours photographing over 60 of these standing stones. Many of them have short inscriptional labels or reliefs, in varying degree of illegibility because of weathering and overgrowth. The inscriptions, when legible, amazingly utilized the exact same early alphabet that we had seen on Mount Aragratz. Incredible. For a lack of any better explanation, the common Armenian interpretation of this field is that they might represent some type of astronomical markers, similar to Stonehenge. But this makes no sense, as many of these stones, when you look through them, don't even point to the stars. What makes this exceptional megalithic monument unique are the small holes which have been bored into the rock at different angles. What we see with these holes is that they are pointed at different alignments to positions uh, on the horizon or into the night sky. Uh, what they're pointing at is still a mystery to us. And Karahunj is quite different from Stonehenge, especially in that at its center there is a tomb. The most important question then is, who is buried in this tomb? The earlier stone carvings at Lake Kerry directed us to this location, so it must be important. The weathered inscriptions written at this location answer this question. A number of them refer to the tomb of Shim and his wife. 
one of the clearer inscriptions can be read on one of the markers. The word Keber is written down the left side of the inscribed stone. Then the name of Shem is written down the right side of the stone, and again, in smaller letters, down the lower part of the center. Other names of the men in Noah's family are found there as well, but none of those have the word for grave or tomb associated with them. So perhaps they are the ones who made this megalithic area. Thus, the most important grave at the center of this complex is that of Shem and his wife. Or it could be that his wife was buried in the secondary tomb just to the south of the central grave, as it also stands out as being very unique. So with our spirits buoyed considerably by the discoveries at Karahunj, we took another excursion into a large valley three-hour drive south of Sision. As we came up out of the valley on its north side, our host and driver said, Oh, I forgot to take you to the observation point. Williams notes that as they walk out onto the observation point, he states, I noticed two strata of rock, the modern rock on top to provide a viewpoint, and the older rocks underneath were carved in badly weathered inscriptions and reliefs similar to those seen on Mount Eregatz and in the field of the megaliths at Karahunj. This time, the carvings revealed a connection between the word for grave, tomb, and the name of Japheth, another one of Noah's sons. How amazing is that? An ancient trail left behind by some of the first generation people from the Ark itself, directing us to the tombs of the first patriarchs themselves, written in stone for future generations to find. Amazing. But the journey is not over yet. Next, we look at the grave of Noah himself. After 20 years of research, a modern-day explorer recently made a discovery of a lifetime. Dr. Charles Willis located and photographed, for the first time, Noah's tomb, located on Mount Judy. It is also called different names over the years, including Mount Ararat, Mount Lubar, Mount Kudi. Those are some of the most popular ones. But modern local traditions place the grave of Noah on the southern slope of Mount Judy. And in 1911, British explorer Gertrude Bell recorded the location of Noah's tomb on this mountain. She wrote, I ought to have completed the pilgrimage by visiting his grave, but it lay far down upon the southern slopes of Judy Dach, which is Mount Judy. In addition to that, the ancient biblical text of the Book of Jubilees states, Noah slept with his fathers and was buried on Mount Lubar in the land of Ararat, chapter 10, 13 through 17. One of the region's major cities lies just north of the mountain. It is named Sernak. William noted that this comes from Sahiri Nu, or the city of Noah. Willis tracked down this location using ancient maps and found a nearby village where he would set up camp, rest, and plan the expedition. The locals were of great help, as they have helped him with information from legends and the layout of the local terrain. From where Williams was staying, in the village, he was able to see the ruins of Heshton, a site of the first Noahic village, according to local tradition. The specific site, identified as Noah's tomb, is in a lone, isolated location on a gentle slope of the mountain on the south side. It is overgrown and undisturbed cut out of solid rock as a horizontal cave, its entrance now gives the appearance of being built with solid stone bricks, and the entrance is blocked as you try to enter, by stones of great size just a few feet inside the entrance. So to recap, and also look at even more details, we have a modern day explorer, Dr. Charles Willis, who has both located and photographed the tomb of Noah. Until archaeologically validated, he believes this is the location based on the above facts, and I tend to agree with him. But for even more reasons, let's take a look. Here are 12 more reasons why I agree that this could be the actual place of Noah's tomb. Local tradition in Armenia has always placed Noah's grave on the southern slope of Mount Judy. It is the oldest place on earth to make the claim. The region also has the oldest winery on earth. And as we know, Noah got off the ark and did what? He planted a vineyard. Mount Judy is called the place of descent, 
referring to Noah and the location where the Ark came to rest after the Great Flood, according to early Christians and Islamic traditions. The ancient Bible text called the Book of Jubilees mentions that Noah was buried on Mount Lubar, which is the modern-day Mount Judy, in the land of Ararat. As mentioned earlier in chapter 10, verse 15 through 17, we read, And Noah slept, or aka died, with his fathers and was buried on Mount Lubar in the land of Ararat. 950 years he completed his life in the 19th Jubilee and two weeks and five years. Even the Quran says that the ark landed on Mount Judy. It reads, And the word was spoken, O earth, swallow up thy waters, and O skies, cease thy rain. And the waters sank into the earth, and the will of God was done. And the ark came to rest on Mount Judy. And the word was spoken, Away with these evil-doing folk. Then we have Gertrude Bell, the British explorer in 1911, who recorded the location of the tomb on Mount Judy and documented its whereabouts by describing it in great detail. The tomb matches her descriptions and location and is described as a horizontal cave on a gentle slope low on the south side of Mount Judy and is made from large cut stone isolated away from any other grave or tomb. Williams tracked down the location using ancient maps, received help from locals, and learned all about the legends and local terrain that also pointed to this region. Then we have the Ruins of Heshton, which is identified as the first Noic village according to local tradition and can be seen from the village where Willis was staying. The Babylonian priest Barossus lived around 250 BC. He went to this location and recorded this as the mountain where Noah had came to rest and documented details about Noah's Ark from seeing them. Next is the fact that the region's major ancient city, Sarnak, originated from the word Shashuri Noah, which means the city of Noah. Mount Judy is just 19 miles away from Sarnak, which is Noah's resting place. The tomb discovered is very different than any other tomb in the area. It is not only much older, but is the only tomb constructed out of large cut stones, which are very out of place for the region. Besides the earliest writing systems discovered near this location, we also have the earliest forms of Armenian art carved right near Noah's grave. And near the top of the mountain, another carving of the exact same style and type, next to an ancient mosque, where tradition has it that Noah himself built and is still visible to this day. We still find documents of these locations being recorded throughout history, we read in the 9th century, Arab geographer Ibn Qurdadbi recorded that the Ark was still visible in his lifetime. Also, Yaqut al-Hamawi, a medieval geographer, also describes Mount Judy and mentions the mosque built by Noah was still visible in his day. That same one, documented by Gertrude Bell, which we can still see remnants of to this day. So we have the Biblical Dead Sea Scrolls, with the Book of Jubilee, the Quran, and even the Mesopotamian Epic of Gilgamesh all specifically placing the Ark landing on Mount Judy. The Bible itself only refers to the mountains of Ararat, which is plural, but not a specific mountain itself. So far, this is the top candidate for Noah's grave based on the sheer amount of evidence and corroborating evidence. Here we have a story surrounded by evidence, and much more than anywhere else. Until further discoveries come to light, this is the best candidate we have for the physical location of Noah and his grave. If you had to pick any book of the Bible to guess that archaeologists had proven accurate, the book of Genesis would probably be near the bottom of that list. But they did discover the existence of an entire kingdom that many secular historians didn't actually believe existed. The Edomites were descendants of the Esau, who founded the kingdom of Edom in the book of Genesis. Esau was the grandson of Abraham and the ten times great grandson of Noah. The name Edom means red and comes from Esau's red hair. Thanks to new research from 2019, we can say that not only did Edom exist, but that they were far more advanced than we would have expected. Edom was in the desert, where the land was far too dry for farming, so they had to rely on trade. They may not have had an abundance of grain or textiles, but they did have 
copper massive amounts of copper they mined this using standardized methods that were extraordinarily advanced and efficient for the time allowing them to mine large amounts of the metal with ease the tinma mine complex in southern israel was already known to exist but the edomites were thought to be a fantasy with mining operations not taking place until the 9th or 10th century bc following egyptian influence while excavating piles of spent slag the waste product of copper smelting pieces of leftover charcoal that were used to heat the smelters were found by using radiocarbon dating on the charcoal they were able to not only find the exact age of the mine but also track the progression of the smelting process and its efficiency what they discovered is that the mines have been active since the 13th century bc not only was this 300 years earlier than historians believed anyone lived there but it matched the biblical timeline for the founding of the kingdom of edom though the edomites make appearances throughout several books of the bible that archaeological proof of something that first appeared in the book of genesis can be found is pretty astonishing Thank you for watching our movie, The Quest for Noah. You can find unlimited resources on our website, standingfortruthministries.com, and our YouTube channel, Standing for Truth and Young Earth Creation. This includes numerous must-read books, such as The Quest for Noah, which provides even more detail on the evidence that you have been provided here in this important movie and also the book Special Creation, which covers all of the overwhelming evidence for the biblical model of ancestry, specifically separate ancestry. If you are not yet subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And please share around this content as the truth is so important. God bless.